Okay, let's uh, let's get started. Um, I'm really happy to introduce uh, Pam Samuelson, who's the inaugural speaker in this new series we've created for the Bren School, this uh, distinguished um, lecture series in information technology and society. It's something that um, Marios and I cooked up, and um, the plan is to do one of these each semester. And uh, each quarter, sorry. <laughs> I, I can't shape Michigan from my, <laughs> from my head. Um, and um, so I'm delighted that uh, we have with us Pam Samuelson, who is the uh, R Richard M. Sherman 74 Distinguished Professor of Law and Information at the University of California, Berkeley, and is director of the Berkeley Center for Law and Technology. To me, she's sort of the go-to person uh, on the challenges of the new information technologies posed for traditional legal regimes, particularly intellectual property law. She's very active and very honored. I can only list a few of many activities and awards. She's the co-founder and president of the Authors Alliance. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a fellow of the ACM, a contributing editor of CACM, our kind of uh, premier journal in computer science, and a past fellow of the MacArthur Foundation. She's a vice chair of the board of directors of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And she joined the Berkeley faculty in 1996 after having been on the, the law school faculty at the University of Pittsburgh. And of course, her new dean is our founding dean of our law school, who now <laughs> is at Berkeley. Today, she's going to talk to us about what's at stake in the Oracle versus Google software copyright case. Okay. First of all, thanks very much for the invitation. I'm really honored uh, to do this. And one of the reasons why I was excited about uh, the opportunity to do this is because uh, I have felt like uh, uh, I've spent most of my career trying to be a bridge between people who are interested in information technology and people who are interested in law. Uh, and for the first dozen years that I was at Berkeley, I had half my appointment at the information school, uh, which is kind of like uh, your informatics uh, group, and um, half my appointment at the law school. Uh, and so I've actually uh, kind of written to and spoken to uh, technical audiences for most of my career, and I take joy uh, in doing so. Uh, so this idea that information technology people ought to know a little bit more about uh, information policy than sometimes they do. Uh, and also that lawyers, uh, who are plenty happy to regulate whatever they see, um, <laughs> need to know something about information technology in order to be able to make sound uh, decisions about whether to regulate, and if so, how to regulate. Uh, so this kind of bridging opportunity that I've had uh, in my career has been uh, something that's been uh, a great pleasure for me and I feel like I've uh, done my level best to enrich the fields uh, that I've been uh, talking, uh, talking to and talking about uh, for some part of my career. Now, Back in uh, the 1990s, uh, there were a look and feel lawsuits. Uh, some people actually may uh, remember them. Uh, Lotus v. Borland and Apple v. Microsoft were two big cases at the time. And one of the things that happened during the look and feel lawsuits was that people uh, who were technical, um, people who designed user interfaces, people who were uh, software developers, they knew that there were these lawsuits, but they didn't know what the lawyers were talking about. Um, they didn't know the terms of discourse that lawyers use and the way that lawyers frame things. And so some part of my goal today is to help you understand how <coughs> the things that the technical people, whether you're in favor of Oracle or Google or you don't have an opinion, um, it's the case that uh, it may help you to kind of understand how lawyers think about these things. And um, part of the reason why I think this is a particularly good uh, example of uh, something to uh, uh, be as a, a bridge for you uh, is that Oracle has been seeking $9 billion um, from Google. Um, and 
that kind of gets your attention. And of course, if Google wins, as it has so far, um, Oracle will get nothing. Uh, so the difference between nine billion and zero <laughs> is a pretty big number. Um, so, uh, so that's actually <coughs> something that I think is, is just worth highlighting as we kind of start through this. The stakes are huge. Uh, and uh, they're huge not only for Oracle and Google, but also, as I'll, I'll show you, um, many other people who, uh, uh, who are developing uh, content for the Android platform uh, and even people who use it. So <laughs> let me kind of uh, tell you kind of what we're uh, going to do. I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, explaining to you why it is that <coughs> computer software has been a troublesome subject matter uh, for U.S. intellectual property law for more than 50 years. Okay, so it's like we have been trying to figure out how to think about copyright and patent in relation to computer programs for more than 50 years, and we're still pretty confused about it. That, I think, is pretty interesting. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences between these two uh, bodies of law uh, and uh, then try to show how the Oracle v. Google case uh, poses some really fundamental questions to which there are no easy answers. So uh, one of the ways to frame it is our program interfaces, because uh, that's what Google is alleged to have uh, misappropriated, are they copyrightable, patentable, both or neither? And you can make a plausible case for all four of those options. Um, uh, and so that's going to be kind of interesting. Uh, right now, the case went back to the trial court after the Federal Circuit had decided uh, that uh, the Java API elements that had been appropriated were protectable by copyright law. The case was remanded back to the trial court for uh, a jury trial about whether or not Google's use of the Java API elements that it took was fair use or infringement. And I'm going to talk to you about what fair use and uh, infringement uh, really are like. So let's start with uh, why is this such troubling uh, subject matter. Well, computer programs uh, are both a writing and a machine and a legal regime that says that something can be either a writing or a machine but it can't be, the uh, it can't be both. Okay, so um, when lawyers look at, com uh, copyright lawyers look at computer programs, they say, oh, they're literary works. You write the program the way you could write uh, a novel. Uh, and because source code is a writing, uh, that means that it's uh, protectable by copyright law. And they kind of ignore that literary work metaphor <coughs> kind of causes you to kind of like not really pay attention to functionality of programs. And so you kind of see it. And so a lot of copyright lawyers look at programs and say, well, the structure of plays or novels can be protected by copyright law. So, so should uh, the structure of computer programs. When patent lawyers look at computer programs, what they see is a machine process and a virtual machine. Since machines and machine processes have historically been patent subject matter uh, for hundreds of years, it looks like it's patentable. Uh, and so uh, and, uh, and any patent lawyer will say, oh, anything that can be constructed in software can also be constructed in hardware. And the hardware version of it, for sure, is a patentable uh, subject matter. But the problem for the patent side is that programs are also writings, and they embody computational processes. And computational processes and writings have traditionally not been uh, subject matter of patents. Uh, and part of the problem here is that when the patent lawyers put their patent hat on, all they see is the machine. And when the copyright lawyers, they all they see is the writing. So it's a kind of tug of war, right? The patent lawyers don't want to get left out. And the copyright lawyers say, hey, this belongs to me. Congress gave it to me. Um, and so uh, I should have control over it. So why does it matter? whether something is copyrightable, patentable, um, uh, and how to keep those things separate. Um, uh, here are some of the key differences. I kind of bolded the things that are the biggest uh, elements of the. So one thing is that the standard of creativity that's required to get 
copyright protection is really low. In fact, the Supreme Court has said it's extremely low. Uh, so we have to just have a teeny modicum of creativity, uh, and uh, that will be enough to, uh, to get copyright protection. Whereas for patenting, it can't just be tiny bit of creativity. It's got to be novel, as in it didn't happen in the world before that we know about. Um, and it has to be not only novel, it has to be non-obvious to people skilled in the art. That is to say, it has to be an invention. Uh, so that's a creativity standard that's much higher than uh, the, uh, the standard in the copyright side. Uh, the rights attach automatically in copyright. Uh, you can't get a patent unless you go to the patent office and you comply with all the standards uh, and have your claims examined. Uh, and you don't get anything until there's actually been uh, an issuance of the patent from the patent office. And if you get it, it doesn't last for any more than tw 20 years. Whereas look at the life uh, of the author plus 70 year term. So you can see that those are two pretty different things. And the subject matters, right? Machine, manufacture, composition of matter, inventions in the useful arts, are really distinct from how we conceptualize writings of authors. So that's a, uh, that's a kind of reason why this is kind of confounding uh, for uh, copyright and for patent. Now, there are two kinds of problems here. One is an incentive to cheat. Um, so uh, one example uh, that I'll, I'll give you is from a case called Odds On versus Omen. Uh, so this guy uh, who made koosh balls, anybody ever use a koosh ball, the little things that are easy to catch? Uh, so it was a utility patent that it issued on koosh balls, and the utility that was <coughs> said to exist in the koosh ball was because it makes it easy to catch, right? That's a functionality that was claimed in the patent. Uh, and koosh balls were getting um, counterfeited, uh, and uh, odds on wanted to stop the, uh, the, the infringing things at the border. But there's a long process you have to go through if you wanted to try to get blockage of things that are infringed patents. And all you have to do is have a registration certificate from the Copyright Office in order to get stop at the border, right? So with the utility patent, he's like, I'm not satisfied with that. I, wanna, I want to. I want copyright too. So he goes uh, to the copyright office, and the copyright office says, "No, it's not copyright protectable." Um, the 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 uh, the, co uh, the, uh, the copyright office doesn't say, "Well, you got a utility patent. That means a, you already said that it's functional." Uh, but they decided that there was no separability of the functionality and the expressiveness of it, so it wasn't protectable by copyright law. But this was an instance where they were trying to cheat, right? It was trying to get a cheat, uh, the, the easy process rather than the hard process, and so uh, that was stopped. But a lot of the problem um, that I've come to sort of recognize is that there are, there are subject matters that are ambiguous, where you kind of like, it looks a little like copyright, it looks a little like pad, it's not really easy to tell what's the difference. Uh, and so, um, I've, I've been kind of collecting examples of things that are uh, that are um, uh, uh, that are ambiguous subject matter. Puzzles, games, toys are categories of things that that's true. Um, this is one of my favorite examples. So this is a this is an anthropometer, according to the guy Korsbisky, who in uh, who is its creator. Now the question is: Is that a machine or is that a sculpture? Well, Korsbisky thought it was a machine, uh, and he sought, a, he sought and obtained a utility patent on it. Uh, and then at some point, somebody took a photograph of it, and he didn't like the photograph. Um, so he went to the copyright office to get a copyright on it, um, because the patent wouldn't give him uh, any relief. Taking a photograph of a patented machine does not infringe the patent, OK? So if he wanted to stop somebody from printing photographs of his thing, he had to have a copyright. So he went to the copyright office. The copyright office uh, actually did issue a registration certificate, but when he tried to enforce it against the people who took the photograph, um, uh, he, um, uh, the, the Court of Appeals basically said, look, you went, I got a patent for it. 
you made you elected protection you don't get copyright and patent at the same time so that's the that's an example okay so um, so intellectual property protections uh, for software quick version here um, there's some things that are pretty straightforward so uh, protecting source code uh, flowcharts uh, other kind of uh, written preparatory materials um, those are easily protected by copyright law um, internal design elements of uh, software for the most part uh, are protected uh, by trade secrecy law uh, patents have kind of gone down and then up and then down uh, so we're kind of in a uh, a down phase, and I'll talk about that a little bit uh, more later, but, um, but lots of things have been kind of fluid in this space for some time, but these are more or less the kind of the easy, straightforward things. So what's hard? Well, the hard part um, is whether or not copyright extends to what's often called the structure, sequence, and organization, or SSO, of programs, uh, and how do you separate that uh, SSO from the process, procedures, system, and method of operation exclusions that Congress put into the copyright statute. And that is exactly the question that the Oracle v. Google case raises. So let me give you the whole of this provision that I've been puzzling on uh, for most of my career. So it says, in no case does copyright protection extend to any idea, procedure, process, system, method of operation, concept, principle, or discovery, regardless of how it's embodied in the work. Now, one thing you know is that if Congress passed the law saying that computer programs are copyrightable, you can't take that literally, right? So the, the source code, strictly speaking, is a procedure, but the source code's got to be protected by copyright law. If anything is, that's got to be. Um, the, uh, and the the machine executable code, for sure, is a machine process, but they can't mean that either. So they have to mean something else, something that's more structural in character. Uh, and one of the reasons why we want to have that kind of exclusion of uh, uh, kind of things in a, in a computer program or in other kinds of works of, of authorship is that we don't want copyright to give patent-like protection. So example. Um, uh, if, you draw, um, if you draw a drawing of uh, a parachute, and it's a really neat parachute design, you can get copyright protection for the drawing as a drawing, but you don't get copyright protection for the design of the parachute, um, because if you want to get exclusive rights in a parachute design, you have to go to the patent system. That kind of thing is very well established in, uh, in intellectual property law. So you have to sort of say, oh, I have to kind of like filter out and try to figure out what is the expression in this thing. And uh, it's not so easy to do. Um, so one of the things that courts have come to recognize is the scope of copyright protection in computer programs is generally thinner than for conventional literary works <coughs> because there are more functional design elements and you're not supposed to use copyright to protect those functional uh, design elements. Uh, and plaintiffs in these cases always want to say, oh, I'm, I, you stole my protectable SSO. <coughs> but they don't try to distinguish between what is the unprotectable <coughs> procedure process system because all processes, systems, etc., have some structural character to them. So um, this kind of SSO thing basically makes it look like the scope of copyright is really broad when maybe it should be quite a bit thinner. So just to reacquaint you with the, the facts of the Oracle v. Google case, um, Oracle bought Sun in 2010. It became the owner of intellectual property rights in Java technologies that Sun's engineers had developed. Um, uh, an important part of the Java technologies was the application program interface uh, for, uh, for Java. Uh, and um, the goal of Java at the time that it was developed was to enable programmers to write code once that could run on any machine. Uh, Oracle and Sun both <coughs> had licensing programs uh, for the use of Java technologies and there was a time when Google uh, uh, was negotiating with Sun about a possible license to use Java, but ultimately decided to go it alone for development of the Android platform. 
Um, but it didn't go totally on its own uh, because it decided to use 37 of the 166 packages of the Java API. Um, and uh, it also developed uh, many other new API uh, elements and packages for smartphone functions. Uh, the Java API was originally developed for kind of enterprise software, not for things that are going to work on a, on a phone. And then the next thing you know, Oracle sues Google for patent and copyright infringement. Case went to trial uh, initially in 2012. The jury rejected uh, the patent claims. Uh, the judge basically said to the jury, assume for the purpose of uh, your uh, fact finding uh, that the Java API packages that uh, Google used were protectable by copyright law and then uh, asked whether or not uh, Google had infringed those or made fair use. The, 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 the jury returned a verdict that yes, he, the, there, was a, uh, there was a reproduction uh, of the, uh, of the uh, API elements, uh, but they split 11 to 1 on fair use, where the 11 was, most people thought it was fair use, and one holdout said no, it wasn't fair use. So Oracle then appeals to the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Normally, software copyright cases would go up to the Ninth Circuit, which is the circuit we all live in. Um, but because there were patent claims in the case, it goes to the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit instead. And the judge basically, the three-judge panel, decided that, um, that the trial judge had been wrong to say that the elements uh, copied were, um, were unprotectable by copyright law, but then remanded the case down for fair use. Um, Google asked the Supreme Court to review, but the, the court decided not to do that. Uh, there was then, um, uh, about a year and a half ago, a two-week jury trial um, on uh, Google's fair use defense, and it won um, the, that jury trial. Uh, but the case is heading back to the Federal Circuit, and uh, I think it's December 7th um, um, that the oral argument will be heard uh, before the Federal Circuit. So we'll, we'll know more about kind of what's likely to happen in that case after, uh, after that. So um, you all don't need to uh, be told about the, the Java API, but um, it obviously uh, has, uh, there was 166 packages. Each package has um, a large number of classes of functions and then uh, there are also declarations or uh, method headers uh, which are kind of more specific. Um, so uh, the, uh, the kind of math max uh, uh, is uh, an example of, uh, of one of the kind of method headers that, uh, that was appropriated. This is where a number of which number is large and which which number is larger than the other is the what that's supposed to what that's supposed to represent. So the Android platform consists of about 15 million lines of code. Um, Oracle claims that um, that uh, that 11,500 of the method headers were copied, um, and that was literal infringement. Uh, and so um, the question is, is that infringement or not? And that's the question that. We've been. Now, why does it look like, um, why does something like uh, the Java API look like copyright? This is a selection and arrangement of words. And um, compilations of words and compilations of data can be protectable by copyright law as long as there's a modicum of creativity. Uh, and uh, arguably, there was literal copying of those 11,000 plus declarations. Uh, Google wrote its own implementing code and thought that that was going to be um, uh, fine. Um, one of the things that Google argued was that, the, that there are quite a few patents on application program interfaces. Uh, and in fact, Sun and, and uh, Oracle both had actually gotten patents on, uh, on APIs. So uh, that meant that it was patent subject matter, not copyright subject matter. Uh, and uh, the Federal Circuit said, I don't see why I can't get both. Uh, so this kind of question about is it patent, copyright, both or neither is actually a really uh, open and interesting uh, question. 
Um, I'm in the neither camp, just so we're clear. Uh, but we'll see. We'll talk about that maybe over. Um, so uh, just a, a sense, I wanted to give you just a sense about what kinds of arguments uh, uh, Oracle and Google were making. Uh, so Oracle basically says, hey, you literally copied uh, 11,000 lines of the declaring code. Um, and you also called, uh, call, copied the organization uh, of declarations in those classes within the Java API uh, packages that were appropriated. And that's structure, sequence, and organization, and therefore that's infringement. Um, there's a concept in copyright law now where if there's, as a practical matter, no other way to, to sort of express certain things, then the idea and the expression are said to be merged. And then because you can't separate them, you, because you don't protect ideas, you don't protect this merged expression. So um, the judge basically said, um, no merger of, uh, of idea and expression because uh, the Java API was highly creative and there's more than one way of doing something. Uh, and it dismissed out of hand the kind of argument that it was a, a procedure or a method of operation. Uh, and um, that was the kind of the, that was Oracle's argument. And this is exactly what the Federal Circuit um, uh, decided to rule. Now, Google was relying on a set of cases from the 1990s. So the other one was more the 80s cases. This was more the 90s <coughs> cases. There were um, uh, a number of cases in which the courts had held that program interfaces necessary for achieving interoperability uh, are unprotectable by copyright law, um, sometimes using one theory or another. But uh, the point here is that the um, the court decisions uh, that Google was relying on really took a, um, a much more skeptical look and a more doubtful look about, uh, about the protectability of interfaces and uh, uh, argued that it was a merger because the Java language and the declarations were not very different from each other, uh, and uh, Oracle was not claiming copyright in the Java language. It was just saying that the declarations um, could have been expressed in the Java language in a different way. And so there was a fight about that. The trial judge was more skeptical about this, uh, the extent to which you could distinguish the language and the declarations. There were six types of cases uh, that had been um, uh, that had been decided before um, the Oracle uh, v. Google case um, uh, in which APIs were held unprotectable. I give you kind of a sense of them here. There were a number of different kinds of contexts within which the APIs were held unprotectable, uh, but the Federal Circuit basically said, no, um, as long as it's original and there was any other way to do it, um, it's protectable by copyright law. Uh, and um, uh, there's no compatibility exception. So uh, an important thing about the Federal Circuit's decision, the Oracle v. Google case, on the quote unquote copyrightability issue is that, um, that it calls into question the analysis in all of these cases, right? So all of these cases would, under the Federal Circuit's conception, of, um, uh, of copyright, um, scope of copyright and software, all these cases would have been decided differently. And some of them are actually Ninth Circuit cases, which means that um, uh, the Federal Circuit is supposed to be bound by what the Ninth Circuit case law says, and they just flat out lied, okay? <laughs> now, I will tell you, okay, if, if, I had, if I had a student who interpreted these Ninth Circuit decisions uh, the way that Judge O'Malley did in the Oracle v. Google decision by the Federal Circuit, I would, I would, I would flunk them. Okay, yes. there's just no question in my mind. This was absolute <laughs> lie. Okay, not even close to the truth. Okay, and okay, I have, to, I have a thing. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I hate liars. Okay, I just really wow. hate liars. Um, well, you can imagine who I hate right now. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so, um, so the Federal Circuit basically. Um, uh, on every single legal point was just flat out wrong. Um, and so I've been spending the last year and a half of my life writing articles basically trying to um, show that. So it gets me wild. Anyway, the Supreme Court um, uh, actually asked the Solicitor General about whether it should take the Google appeal 
Um, and there are a bunch of reasons why it would have been a good idea. So it's a case of exceptional importance to the software industry. The question about whether interfaces are protectable by copyright law or not is absolutely fundamental to the software industry. You can't have the software industry without um, uh, people being able to interoperate. There were conflict uh, among different appellate courts as to the interpretation of this process procedure exclusion <coughs> for copyright. Uh, about the application of the merger doctrine, the significance of interoperability, uh, and the question about whether if something's patent subject matter, can it be copyright subject matter at the same time? Those issues are all ones where there have been different points of view. Um, and moreover, the Supreme Court, when it took Lotus's appeal um, from the federal, uh, from the First Circuit's decision in favor of Borland. Um, it was exactly the same legal issue that they'd split on four to four. Um, so it was, you should have taken it, but they didn't. Um, so then the case goes back uh, to, the, um, uh, to, the, uh, to the trial court for, for trial. But uh, I'll just, you know, again, this is again a place where the distinction that people in the technical community would raise and the distinction in the legal community are pretty different. Um, uh, people that I talk to who are technologists basically say interfaces, everybody should be able to use them, but you should have to re-implement uh, them in your own way. Now exactly what an interface is is a thing that's, uh, that people debate uh, about, but uh, for at least 24 years, uh, uh, after a uh, decision in 1992, it was kind of like settled law that interfaces were not protectable by copyright law. And so the Federal Circuit's like casting doubt on this whole thing. We don't really know uh, how influential it will be uh, over time. Uh, but um, uh, uh, in a paper that I wrote with uh, Mitch Kapor and a couple of other people, uh, we talked about interfaces as industrial compilations of applied know-how, and I think those are things that neither copyright nor patent should be protecting, but that's just me. Okay, so the problem here is really pretty deep. Um, uh, one thing that I think uh, folks in this audience may sort of recognize is that um, if nine million Java programmers, if there are nine million Java programmers in the world, and they've all taken classes and they've all learned how to speak, so to speak, uh, in the declarations that are part of the Java API. You got a big investment in that, and there are kind of like hundreds and thousands, maybe thousands of books that have been written about the Java API, and they all reproduce all of the Java API. Now, Oracle is not suing them, they're suing Google, right? So. Um, so if the Java API was this crown jewel protectable expression, you would think that they'd sue the people. But no, they want people to write uh, in Java. They want people to, uh, to be invested, but they want to be the only ones who get the payoff of this. So the, the question about whether or not you can force programmers uh, who learn Java to speak in a different dialect of Java in order to program for the uh, for the Android platform <coughs> is one of the questions that this case uh, really uh, poses. And I think that's something which uh, is a pretty deep and important problem. Okay, so let's uh, talk for a few minutes about fair use. So there's uh, uh, a norm in US copyright law that says that, um, uh, that Copyright owners have the right to control the reproduction and distribution of copies of, uh, of the copyrighted work. Uh, but that's limited by a concept called fair use. And whether you realize it or not, you make use of fair use all the time. Yeah. Every time you format shift something, every time you sort of share a file with somebody, every time that you uh, download uh, music, not that you do it in <laughs> um, uh, you're, you're relying on this concept of fair use. I, no harm, no foul, right? That's kind of a, another way of thinking about it. Uh, but uh, the statute, uh, the copyright statute, actually identifies four factors that are supposed to be considered in making a determination of whether or not something is a fair use. If it's a fair use, <coughs> it's not infringement. It's not excused infringement. 
is just not infringement. Um, so uh, that's a pretty big thing. Okay, so the first factor that is to be considered is the purpose of the challenge use. What did the defendant, why did the <coughs> defendant do something? Um, uh, and uh, to the extent that you can say that something is transformative, um, that will weigh more in favor of, uh, of fair use. And what is transformative? Um, well, um, parody is a good example, right? You take something from uh, an existing work and you make fun of it. In order to make fun of it, you actually have to appropriate some of it. So that's, a, a, that's the kind of classic example of a transformative uh, type of use. A second uh, factor is the nature of the copyrighted work. Generally speaking, uh, fair use is broader when works are factual uh, um, or functional uh, in contents. Uh, and narrower if it's artistic and fanciful, uh, although again in cases involving parody, uh, that may be uh, that may be less uh, salient than uh, the amount and substantiality of the taking uh, and the harm, if any, to the market for the work or for the for the value. Now there are very few software fair use cases, so there's not as much kind of to build on as there is about parodies and other kinds of uh, uses that copyright uh, has encountered over the years. So let me tell you what Oracle's arguments were. And these are the arguments that they're making actually now uh, to the Federal Circuit. So this is bad. Google had a bad purpose. Um, uh, its purpose was commercial, and commercial is bad. Um, uh, uh, Google acted in bad faith uh, because it uh, talked to uh, Sun about a license and then it just went off and used it anyway. Um, it's non-transformative because the Java declarations are being used for exactly the same purpose as they were being used uh, uh, for license uses of Java. And uh, although this is not given as much attention right now, <coughs> Uh, it is one of the things that irks um, uh, uh, Oracle is that Google forked Java, uh, undermining the kind of write once, run everywhere kind of uh, norm. And so that is actually something that, from the standpoint of copyright law, kind of doesn't fit, right? It's not really a kind of thing. That's not a kind of harm that copyright law really contemplates, but it is one of the things that is irksome to Oracle. Uh, the nature of the work, well, um, Oracle has been pushing the analogy to this is like ripping off a Harry Potter novel. Um, I think that's preposterous, um, <laughs> but, um, uh, but the Federal Circuit bought it the last time, and so it's, being, it's kind of resurrected in the new brief. I mean, if it worked the first time, you've got to try it the second time, um, but it's preposterous. Um, the amount appropriated is 11,000 uh, 11, lines of declaring code. Uh, and that actually seems like a lot to Oracle. And then what kind of harm is there to the market? Well, one harm is you, you should have been paying me a license fee for using uh, the Java API. And moreover, other companies are less likely to use, uh, uh, to take a license now because Oracle, because uh, Google basically used a whole bunch of it without permission. So why should I pay? Or if I'm going to pay, I'll pay a little bit less than I would otherwise pay. And, uh, and uh, the kind of $9 billion uh, thing is partly attributable to this notion that Oracle was unable to compete successfully uh, in the smartphone market because uh, essentially uh, Google had a first mover advantage uh, by virtue of uh, the Android uh, platform uh, and uh, by making the, the Android platform software available for free, it makes it hard to make money off the licensing fees uh, for Oracle. <laughs> Now, Google, guess what, has a different point of view about this. Um, so from uh, Google's standpoint, uh, its use was transformative because <coughs> Google Im incorporated these jo Java declarations into a highly creative Android platform that achieved enormous success in the marketplace. And they just appropriated the parts that they needed, uh, they said, uh, so the amount taken was reasonable in light of the uh, the purpose um, uh, that they had, the whole Java API was designed for a tip, different kind of thing. Android needed a lot of API elements that were just 
for smartphones, and that's what that's the stuff that they added. Um, they want to say the API is highly uh, functional and engineered for utilitarian ends, so it's not like the Harry Potter novel at all. Uh, and uh, Google is arguing that there's no harm to the market because neither Sun nor Oracle made uh, a competing product that uh, found any kind of acceptance in the marketplace. Uh, and uh, Google is also arguing that fair use is designed to foster innovation and their common industry practices to allow re, uh, independent re-implementation of APIs. Now, I think there were some other factors that may have influenced the, the jury in this particular case. Uh, so one is that both Oracle and Sun CEOs made public statements that were supportive of the Android platform and the use of the Java API before <laughs> they brought the suit. Okay, so it's like that has got to be one of the parts of the trial that the, that the lawyers for Google are looking forward to. Here is a picture of uh, Larry Ellison uh, saying positive things about the Android platform. Um, and actually Sun CEO, uh, last CEO, uh, testified in support of Google um, that uh, the API uh, uh, was free to, uh, for everybody to use. So, um, so Jonathan Schwartz basically uh, supported uh, their case. Uh, some witnesses also testified to the inseparability of the Java language and the declarations. Um, and uh, although Sun uh, did <coughs> develop a Java platform for mobile devices, but um, those products were failures in the marketplace. And so um, uh, it made uh, Oracle look like a sore loser, right? Having lost out on this huge market opportunity is like, oh, somebody else made billions of dollars on that. I want that money. And so that's what they're trying to do. Uh, and uh, Sun had been one of the foremost proponents of no copyright and APIs yeah. as the law uh, in, uh, for a long time. So all this stuff was kind of in addition. It doesn't really fit within the usual context of the fair use defense, but was actually quite, I think, uh, influential. So um, uh, the Court of Appeals uh, decided that there was a triable issue of fact about whether the Google's use of the Java API elements uh, was fair use or infringement, sent it back for trial. The jury then after two weeks of trial uh, deliberated and uh, came back with a verdict uh, unanimously in favor of the fair use defense. And so what lawyers do after they lose a case like this is they make a motion for a judgment notwithstanding the verdict. Um, uh, so what are you going to do, right? Um, so, uh, so they made a, a, a saying, as a matter of law, we're entitled to, uh, to judgment in our favor, and uh, Google's fair use defense has to be uh, thrown out. Now, the judge who was really getting tired of these people, <laughs> the case has been pending before him since 2010, um, and he really is tired of these people, like really a lot. Um, so uh, one of the things the judge does is he basically tries to write uh, an opinion uh, denying Oracle's motion, but basically sticking up for the jury. Now. In our legal system, what is the function of a jury? It's to find facts, right? I say um, this was self-defense, you say it's murder, okay? So it can't be both, it's gotta be one or the other. So a jury basically hears evidence from the, from the, uh, from the witnesses and reads in other documents and hears things and it makes a decision that either it was self-defense or it was murder, but whatever okay it can't be both you gotta you gotta choose so what the what the uh, what the trial judge basically did is say here are examples of disputed issues of fact was google acting in good faith or bad faith that is a classic jury issue right um uh sort of 
You can imagine all kinds of things. I say it's good faith, you say it's bad faith. It's like, oh, can't, can't be both. It's gotta be one or the other. And so the jury, so the, when appellate courts are supposed to be reviewing these cases, they basically have to construe the facts in light of the jury verdict. So the, the jury didn't get like a little checklist saying good faith, bad faith didn't get a checklist to say this or that. It basically came back with a fair use ruling. So if there's evidence in the record that would support the conclusion that the jury reached, then the appellate court is supposed to be uh, bound to interpret the facts that the jury must have found good faith rather than bad faith, must have found that Google's use was transformative instead of non-transformative the way that Oracle is arguing. Um, it must have been, they must have decided that what Google used was reasonable in light of its purpose and it must have rejected Oracle's claim about harm to the market, right? So, so this is an effort by the trial judge to essentially bolster the jury finding so that when Oracle takes the case up to the federal circuit, um, is trying to bulletproof right, this thing. So, so what, are, what is Oracle appealing on? It's saying, I'm still entitled to a judgment as a matter of law. Now this is, should be uh, like an easy kind of case for the Federal Circuit to say, no way. Um, why? Because the Federal Circuit previously said there's a triable issue of fact. It went down, they had a trial, the jury found for Google, it was like case over, right? Well, but this is the Federal Circuit and um, they have their own kind of complexion. I could go on, uh, on about them, but I'm gonna spare you that. Um, but they're also, uh, Oracle is also asking for a new trial in which it can offer more evidence of Google's use of the same Java API packages on other kinds of, uh, of uh, of devices, right? So it started out as a, a lawsuit about phones, but of course Android as a platform has actually ex extended into lots of other kinds of devices, uh, and so Oracle wants to be able to try um, uh, the use, and the trial judge said, look, bring a separate lawsuit if you have to, okay? But this case is about smartphones, and that's all it's about. Um, so uh, it'll be interesting to see what the Federal Circuit does with this, uh, but um, uh, basically Oracle's asking the Federal Circuit to say, no reasonable jury could have found fair use. Hmm. Now, I think this is a place where this should be a really easy case, but it's not. So what happens if Oracle wins, though? All right? I mean, they won the last time. Uh, and they have the same lawyer uh, who's taking it up, and he's really good. <laughs> I have to say, I, 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 have, I have admired his work on other things. I would really love him to uh, get the flu or something. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, um, so if you, you know, the question is, how broad is Oracle's theory of copyright in the Java API? If you think about it, right, Everybody who uh, makes phones with Android on them, they're copying and distributing copies of, of the program that said to infringe, okay? So Samsung and every other maker of phones and other devices that have Android on them, they're all infringers. Now, you say, oh, can't be infringers. But copyright is a strict liability offense. What it means is, if it's a reproduction of an infringing thing, you're screwed, okay? Um, so it doesn't make any difference. It, you know, I, I bought it thinking it was perfectly lawful. No excuse, okay? People who write uh, Android apps, infringers, okay? All the people who own Android phones, what do they do? They turn it on every day and they make copies of the, of the software. So you see that the potential range of liability here is unbelievable. Um, and moreover, what it does uh, if this gets reversed, um, if the fair use decision gets reversed, is that it fuels more people to bring more lawsuits that are aggressive in this particular way. And not only that, but also fuels them to add a patent claim to the case, however frivolous that patent claim might be. Because if there is a patent claim in the case, 
it's going to go, the appeal goes to the Federal Circuit. So the Federal Circuit could end up being, instead of having all of the circuit courts that usually hear software copyright cases, Federal Circuit is like, oh, this belongs to me. Um, and so they don't actually believe in competition. They don't believe in innovation. They are really a terrible court. Um, so, uh, so we really don't want them to, uh, we, we don't want them to do it. So I actually am predicting, um, I still believe in rationality. I know it's a little hard to do these days, but I, I think it's really important. Now, one other question I think is worth uh, addressing again before we, uh, before we end is, uh, is really to sort of recognize that the role of intellectual property uh, protections in the software industry is a lot less than a lot of intellectual property lawyers think, right? So um, uh, I did a, a, with some other people, I did a survey of software entrepreneurs and um, first mover advantage and complementary assets are really the things that they think give them competitive edge. Um, they like copyright, they like trade secrecy, patents are really pretty unimportant to them. Um, uh, and if you kind of think about a lot of the business models that people have these days um, in the software industry, you don't really depend, right? If software is a service. You don't really need um, intellectual property protection for it. Um, if you're running a platform and all your users give you content, you don't need. If you're ad uh, supported, you don't need it. So there are lots of ways for the industry to uh, to get um, uh, to get uh, uh, to get protection. So um, this Oracle v Google case is really the most significant case uh, in the software intellectual property field uh, in the past uh, few decades. Uh, we don't yet know how influential it's going to be, uh, but oh man, what a temptation to find a patent claim so you can go to the federal circuit. Um, uh, I think that you know the software industry is this really amazing industry. It's just grown like crazy. Uh, even though the tools that IP law gives us to deal with it are kind of misfits, right? So um, I like to say this is an example of legal rules that work in practice, even if not in theory. Um, so anyway, that's what I had to say to you. Yeah. Question. Uh, I didn't ask before, but as I remember before Oracle, but Sun, Java has always been the, the Java community process and it's sort of open source. Yeah. So how does one company, by buying something, take that back into a corporate asset so, when it's been open prior? <laughs> that's a good question. And, and the answer is that, 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 that you don't necessarily bind. <coughs> you don't, if you own an intellectual property asset and you use it and exploit it in an open way and somebody buys that asset from you, they are not bound by your decision about but, how to exploit it. Because it was an open project, it really wasn't just some asset. It was a community of the well, contributors that worked on Java, right? Okay. Yeah. So and they, they were not non-Sun engineers that worked on yeah, it. Yeah, right? for sure. So yeah, no, I think the point is well taken. It's just that. Um, that has not emerged as a significant factor. Why didn't they make that argument? Yeah. Well, it should have been I look, thrown they out. They did in the sense case. that Jonathan Schwartz got on the stand and testified that that Sun believed that it was open, yes. that Sun had had a yeah. historical strong position, that application program interfaces are not protectable by copyright law, and that he thought that what uh, what Google did was fair within the Java community. Okay, mm -hmm. so Jonathan Schwartz was their main guy on mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it did get in the case. And, and the judge did. Well, no, the point is actually. The judge couldn't decide this. The uh, judge decided that this was a triable issue of fact. fact yeah. Okay, so there was a jury trial, and so the lawyers had to put together whatever case they could. And I think Jonathan Schwartz's evidence actually was influential with the jury. Was uh, Manili also called Scott? Uh, I think he did a brief. Um, on the copyrightability issue. Um, I think that he had some deposition testimony that was introduced. I don't think he showed up in person. I think one thing that actually worked in Google's favor is Larry Page actually showed up in person. So um, 
Uh, Larry Ellison was uh, was kind of the big image on the screen, and Larry Page came, you know, in in uh, in jeans and sat down and talked to the jury as though they were like real people, um, and you know, Larry Ellison might have looked like a. <laughs> you could, well, uh, yeah, we know how it looks like. In the back. I was wondering um, what the technical literacy is of the jurors that are deciding these decisions and how do they educate the jurors? Yeah, um, that's, that's a really good question. So um, the answer to the question is that, uh, that Oracle struck every technically sophisticated person who was in the jury pool. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone. So oh, really? there was no, no one on think. the jury who knew anything oh. about uh, about uh, Java technology. So teaching them as the trial goes on. Expert witnesses. So so what you do if you're if you're uh, running a case like this is that you find the best and most credible and ability to communicate people um, uh, as witnesses. I mean, look, you know, Jonathan Schwartz stands up there and says. You know, this is this has been open. We've Sun has always had a position on this. Uh, we developed, you know, the Java API was developed by a community. It wasn't just a Sun thing. Blah 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 blah. Um, that's got to help. Um, but uh, you know, a lot of what the jury had to deal with was very 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 abstract stuff. And um, does that and happen a lot in juries? Just not knowing the content of what either they're deciding on. So, you know, if you actually want to, uh, so uh, Sarah Jiang did an amazing Twitter stream. Um, and the Twitter stream is on uh, Storify. Uh, and you can follow every single day. She was amazing. Mm. Um, I was actually, uh, I was sitting in my office um, watching the Twitter stream. So you kind of, got, you got the, like, the short version of what every witness was saying. And sometimes, not even she, uh, who's pretty technically sophisticated, um, understood what they were talking about. And she'd have to come back later and say, well, I figured out this is, uh, this is what they were talking about. But, um, but for the most part, the, that's the job of the lawyer to actually present in a way that will, um, uh, and, 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 and bring in a sequence of witnesses. So you bring Jonathan Schwartz in first. Right or among the first people, and then you bring in some more technology people, and then you end with Larry Page. Right, so like, you, so people that 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 were kind of good communicators, um, you want to have that them bookend with the kind of more technical details in the middle, mm -hmm. um, and then of course it's a it's live theater. I mean. Uh, any trial is basically like a Broadway play, stage one performance, yeah. to an audience of 12. OK, that's, that's it. Right. Could, could you one? Um, let, no, let me actually get somebody else. So in, in another um, really super high stakes famous copyright case, Google versus Viacom, or Viacom versus Google, the, the parties uh, famously spent over $100 million each on legal fees before settling with no money exchanging hands, um, which was, faced, since Google was, since Viacom was seeking a billion dollars, was with Google. How much do you think they spent here? Do we have any numbers on that? Um, I haven't seen them, but 100 million actually sounds about right to me. Um, they've, been, they've been litigating full bore since 2010. Okay. 2010. Um, and it's already longer than the Viacom case. Yeah. So it's it's a you know and I, and you know the, the quality of the lawyering is really good. Um, uh, you got to say that for them. Uh, although I will say that I think that um, I think the the lawyer that they brought in uh, on the appeal is better than the lawyer that they had at trial initially. Um, so Horrible. he uh, yeah. For Google. For oh no, Google's Google. lawyer is always the same. Perfect. Oracle <laughs> Oracle lost. It, it, Oracle lost at the district court level on the copyrightability issue, um, and they were litigating with a certain team, and then they brought in Mr. Like Smarty Pants, <laughs> and Mr. Smarty Pants wrote an unbelievable brief um, and just won the federal circuit over. So um, the, yeah, the lawyering is super expensive, but this is one of those things where. 
Oracle and Google can continue to, they, they can afford to continue to litigate this forever. <laughs> um, and not everybody else can, and that's actually one of the things that's scary about this is that this thing you, you know it affects everybody. Um, so you know, Arista, for example, got sued by Cisco. You know, within a couple of months after the Federal Circuit decision and the Oracle v. Google case, uh, Cisco brought this lawsuit against Arista for using 500 of the command line interface uh, elements that. Uh, that Cisco claimed as its uh, protectable expression. And that too went to a jury trial. Um, and it was decided in favor of Arista. And has Cisco given up? No, it's taken that thing up to the Federal Circuit. Um, so I got to write another brief. It really pisses me off. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I've always had another question back there. Well, I had a, she asked my question about the, the jury. I mean, it, so they, they use their peremptories on the sophisticated technological, but they don't have that many. Per Do you think there's some other way these cases should be decided, other than to put them in the hands of ordinary people who don't have any kind of <laughs> well? Look, knowledge? okay. Right. The jury got the jury did a pretty good job, okay. And Judge Alsop loved that jury. Uh -huh. He really loved them. Um, so he actually protected them because, of course, all the press wanted to like uh, interview him, and he helped them get out a back way so that they <coughs> didn't have to encounter any press. Um, so the jury was, he was very protective of them. Okay. Uh, uh, you gave a wonderful presentation. Does any of the judge of the Federal Circuit actually still believe in the spirit of Constitution? <laughs> well, you know, they, I, you know I, w I would say, I'm not saying the Federal Circuit judges um, do not believe in the rule of law, okay? I, not I, rule I'm, of law, it's a basically okay, but the I, But I, the thing is that they have, um, you know, they don't hear copyright cases, generally speaking, so they're not as familiar with that as they are with patents. Generally speaking, they like intellectual property, right? They think that their job is to protect intellectual property rather than to sort of think about it in larger competition and innovation. So they're very doctrinal, they're very formalistic in their conception of things, and unfortunately there's some precedents that they were able to rely on that I consider to be discredited, but hey, if they're still appellate court decisions, then they're appellate court decisions. Well, I think we probably need to wrap this up. Um, okay. Thank you for a Thank really you. fascinating story. <laughs> and watch for announcements of our winter term event.